So Chiara, thank you so much for talking to us about your article uh, for Contemporary Southeastern Europe about textile workers uh, in Stipp uh, in Macedonia. Maybe you can tell us in the beginning uh, why you picked this particular town uh, and this particular economic sector for your research. Thank you, Florian. Yes, I've picked uh, the city of Stipp because Stipp used to be a very important textile hub during socialist times and it remained a textile city in post-socialist times. So, differently than many other cities in uh, the former Yugoslavia, the textile production has continued, only it has tra transformed from uh, state-based socialist production to private production. So, the textile sector is still quite thriving uh, and uh, it gives uh, labor to 45% of the population in Stipp, so it's still quite significant. Mm -hmm. So how did it change from late socialism to today? What are the, what are the, the, the changes in the way in which labor is organized, in which these factories operate? Well, you have to think that during socialism there were two main uh, big factories, Makedonka and Estibo, and that they, uh, each of them employed around 3,000 people. And these big factories were really uh, existing on some sort of community centers. So they were integrating uh, a number of uh, community features, such as uh, a health center, a canteen for the workers. Um, they were also uh, providing housing and holidays facilities to the workers. So they were really uh, central to the life of the city at that time. And what happened with transition is that uh, these big factories have been uh, slowly dismantled and also divided into smaller private factories, so-called confectie, and that this confectie became uh, really like the main um, element of uh, production in Stiv. And these confectie are genetically quite small, they employ around 40, 50 people, and uh, the type of production has changed as well. It is no longer a production based on what was called a full package, meaning the whole uh, textile collection from the yarn and the raw production to the garment, but this is generally this delocalized uh, outward processing trade production, or OPT as it is called, mainly um, workers are only assembling um, uh, textile and garments uh, whose main material are coming from Western Europe. So they get the material from Western Europe, uh, they assemble them and then they ship them back. And Macedonia is, uh, as many other um, places in Eastern and Southeastern Europe, uh, very uh, prized for textile production because it is very close to Western Europe and uh, the labor costs are very low and uh, um, uh, the workers are very experienced. So uh, these elements make Macedonia an interesting place for investors. You're focusing particularly on the gender dimension and how, how women are particularly well left vulnerable in many ways. Can you tell us how this expresses itself and, and uh, in terms of also who is working in the textile sector in terms of, uh, well, based on gender, but also in terms of other background and, and what you're focusing on in your research there? Yes, in my article I'm focusing uh, specifically on the connection between transformation of labor and transformation of gender. And if we look at the textile sector in Macedonia, we can see that uh, it is mainly low-skilled women who are concentrated on this sector. So there's really a, a very clear uh, gender discrimination when we look at the um, textile sector. Also, we have to think that the minimum wage hasn't been yet uni uniform to the minimum wage to other sectors. It will happen only in 2015, so the minimum wage in, uh, in the textile is still uh, much lower than in other manufacturing sector. And uh, somehow uh, we can uh, see a parallel devaluation of uh, labor as a whole in Macedonia, but also devaluation of the position of women in the labor market. So uh, when we look at the type of uh, work that this is done in these factories, we see that it is becoming more and more uh, dangerous because of uh, problems with safety regulation, but also um, we have a lot of overtime work, uh, a lot of low paid work. Uh, so in a way we have a devaluation of women as workers and of women's labor as a whole. What does that mean in terms of uh, the social status of women in, in, in society uh, and the larger impact this has on gender roles in, in a place like Stipp or in Macedonia more broadly? 
as I argue in my article, I'm trying to show that uh, basically uh, the fact that uh, labor as a whole was devalued also contributed to the phenomenon which has been defined as the one of the, uh, sorry, the, the phenomenon of retraditionalization in the post Yugoslav space. So we have a lot of literature from uh, gender studies scholars that look at the uh, as, sorry, the retraditionalization as uh, a phenomenon uh, due to nationalist discourse and uh, due to the war. But as I argue, this is also a phenomenon related to um, the changes in material condition, namely the change in uh, how many women can access work, how many women are unemployed, and generally how women's work is seen. We can find somehow uh, a parallel between the devaluation of the discourse, mainly the loss of egalitarian discourse from socialism, and uh, um, let's say the new nationalist discourse that uh, assign women to the house and to the family, and uh, at the same time this material process of loss of jobs, uh, having to care for the household in times of transition, having to rely a lot on um, uh, intergenerational and family networks. So we can see that these two processes, the ideological one and the material one, are going hand in hand. How do, because I mean your work is based on lots of interviews with women who've been uh, engaged in the sector uh, through different generations, right? Yeah. How do they reflect on this uh, and how do they think about the past? I mean, are they nostalgic for the Yugoslav period or, or how do they cope with these changes? There is definitely uh, some form of nostalgia, but I wouldn't say it's nostalgia for socialism uh, as much as it is nostalgia for the better living standards that they could enjoy during socialism. So uh, if you think that uh, some of them in uh, the late 80s and early 90s, they still were earning around 400 euros. Uh, if compared to the current salary, which is around 200, you can really see um, a very rapid worsening of uh, living standards and purchasing power. So a lot of women feel that their work is not rewarded as it should be, that they have lost some sort of status and dignity that was related to their position as workers in society. And this is uh, uh, the main source of uh, nostalgia, I would say, this feeling of precarity, this feeling of uncertainty, not knowing how to um, survive, uh, there also the fact that uh, the double burden of care work and wage work has increased because you need more and more wages uh, to uh, to sustain the household. All of this is contributing to uh, create this comparison that you hear quite often in narratives of work. It's like, yeah, our parents used to live better, but this time is gone. What can we do, right? So there is all this. Um, sort of uh, evoking of the past as a time in which uh, workers were better treated. Is there, uh, I mean, how do, how do your interviewees make sense of it? I mean, do they say this is globalization, this is democracy, or this is a particular type of government? How do they rationalize or how do they understand these changes which have occurred over the, the, the past two decades? Well, I would say that they are very much uh, enraged about the injustice of the political system, that they find the politics uh, something which is very far from their everyday experience, but also there is some kind of um, uh, yeah, resentment towards uh, entrepreneurs and towards administrators and towards uh, those who didn't manage the privatization process as it should have been. And it's interesting, like in, in my article, I'm trying to also put the voice of the entrepreneurs and of the factory owners as a way to um, to look at the different positioning in society. On the one hand, you have the workers very much uh, raging against uh, entrepreneurs who are asking them to work more and more uh, for lower wages. And on the other hand, the entrepreneurs also tell you, um, well, we cannot do much because the Western client otherwise will go away, mm -hmm. right? So there is also this uh, general feeling of precarization among owners as well, but it's true that the workers feel that they have lost uh, the um, what they have been contributing to build during socialism. So for instance, there, there is this idea where we have contributed to building that canteen, that restaurant, and now it's privatized and nobody gave us anything, right? So there is all this um, feeling of loss, material loss, but also uh, loss of dignity and loss of respect. Mm -hmm. So. How does that, uh, how does that your study fit into a larger understanding of, of a 
society like Macedonian society? I mean, how how does your study shed light, you think, on on these transition processes which we've experienced or which we witness in, in places like Macedonia? I mean, in particular, I guess I'm interested in which way the the economic crisis, the global economic crisis, is featured in those narratives, or is is it kind of subsumized under the, the larger transition period? Yes, I would say that this uh, narrative of the crisis is not so prominent. It is appearing in the sense that uh, textile production has been diminishing in Macedonia with the global economic crisis. But somehow this narrative of crisis and of transition is very much one that encompasses the last 20 years, right? So in the maybe the factory owners are uh, more aware of this global economic crisis because for them has meant you know loss of clients and so on. But for the workers, you can see that there is really this uh, before and after, so to say, narrative. So they will tell you about how it used to be before and how it used to be since the 90s and with a few um, some sort of few um, improvements in between in terms of legislation and in terms of more control in uh, what it, when it comes to safety but it wouldn't it wouldn't really uh, be a marker so to say the global economic crisis it would be like a long crisis that is affecting them since the last 20 years great well thank you so much Chiara for sharing your thoughts with us and also thank you for for writing this really fascinating article thank you very much thanks Goodbye.